Okay, so <clears throat> uh, as Rose said, if you have problems with something, uh, let her know. And uh, I want to, I've given a version of this talk before uh, at the Utah Green Conference, and it's a talk I came up with actually uh, while I was in on sabbatical in Seattle uh, four years ago. And I've actually done a sabbatical there and then about 12 years ago in uh, Oregon in Corvallis. So uh, I'm drawn to the Northwest a little bit. But this picture is actually in Salt Lake City. And it's almost enough to make me like a columnar tree. Um, generally, I don't really like columnar trees. But this one is just outstanding. And uh, it's actually a sugar maple growing in the avenues in Salt Lake City, a nice neighborhood. Um, so if we want a tree like this, or a tree like this, this is a tabletop elm, it's called. It's, I think, a type of American elm. And this one is actually uh, at the Utah County Courthouse, a great tree. Uh, or these London Plains, if, if uh, we want to grow trees like this. This is, this is in the uh, Pioneer Square area of uh, Seattle. Or these residential trees, these incense cedars on the left, and the uh, catalpa on the right. Or this ultimate street tree. Uh, an oak, uh, some kind of live oak, uh, growing in the middle of the street in Solvang, California. If we want to have these trees, we've got to start with this. We've got to start with the root systems. And <clears throat> the root systems are the basis for the tree. They hold it up. They give it water. They give it minerals. And uh, without the root system, we have nothing. So successful tree growing, then, is growing a good root system. OK, so to grow a good root system, you need to know nature. You need to know the natural systems. And it seems like over my career, I've said something like this over and over and over again in presentations I give, that you need to know nature. And actually, no offense to people who don't have forestry degrees or forestry education, but foresters end up often, I think, in the best, uh, uh, with the best ability to know about trees in urban areas, planted trees, cultivated trees, because they know natural about natural trees. <clears throat> they know. Uh, what grows where, how they grow naturally, and and therefore they can use the natural traits that a tree has uh, to their benefit uh, or or uh, counter negative problems uh, by uh, just by knowing that. Uh, so foresters have a leg up. Not that horticulturists and and uh, others can't deal with that, but I think if you're not a forester and you haven't learned about trees in nature, you need to learn as much as you can about trees in nature. OK, so natural tree root systems have a number of characteristics that are important. They're shallow. They're horizontal, for the most part. They're wide. Uh, they form a kind of a root plate. And tap roots, if they exist, are temporary and really don't exist in mature trees. So shallow and wide. I've, a lot of people have seen this slide if they've seen me speak before, but I've enhanced it a little. And uh, I want you to focus on, well, let's see. I can get an arrow here. And uh, I want you to focus on the tree with that dot on the trunk way back in the back. That tree is about 20 meters away from the person taking the photograph. And this 
photo then was taken in a forest, a white spruce forest. White spruce exist in northern uh, northern North America. And they're a very narrow crowned tree. The canopy or the crown of the trees may be, uh, let's say, uh, 15 feet in diameter in a forest like this. It's not very wide, maybe 20 feet. And uh, and what they did, they wanted to photograph how wide and shallow root systems are. And you see a root kind of snaking through the forest. And now I'll show you the enhanced view. And there I photoshopped it a little so you could see better. All they did to photograph this root, and this was just one woody root growing out from the base of that spruce way in the back and growing out 20 meters in one direction, so maybe 70 feet in one direction uh, for a tree that's maybe 20 feet wide. Uh, they just peeled off the duff layer, the organic matter, and the loose needles and, and twigs and things, and didn't dig at all. So they didn't remove any soil from the root. That's not to say that some of this root doesn't go down into the soil. Almost certainly it does. But most of this root, and really most of the root system in a forest like this, is growing right at the surface and just under the duff layer, or if you have turf, in amongst the turf roots. So very shallow and very wide. This tree, if it has roots growing out like this in all directions, could be have a root system that's 40 meters wide. And keep in mind, every one of these trees has a root system like this. I mean, where this is just one root, but you'd have multiple roots coming out from each of these trees, all laying on top of one another. Uh, uh, woven in amongst one another. So it would really be uh, just a network of roots. Horizontal uh, root systems tend to be shallow and wide. <coughs> and uh, uh, and have this horizontal nature. And the closer you get to the surface, the more horizontal it is and the wider it is. Um, and this is just a photo I have of a apple tree at a place where they've done a lot of root research in England. And it shows they've suspended the tree so you can actually see the root system. It goes off the screen on either side. But uh, you see that most of the root system is narrow or is wide. And it doesn't go very deep. The soil level would have been right about there. And uh, most of the root system is done with by the time you get two feet down. Excuse my not using metric all the time. Uh, I'm calibrated better for non-metric, but uh, metric's definitely the way to go. Uh, again, width. Uh, this is a uh, diagram of trees in a forest. And this, I believe, is a red maple. So it's a forest somewhere in the east, 60-year-old red maple. And the edge of the canopy of this tree would probably be about where this circle is. And one root snakes out through the forest, branches and branches again. And in the farthest direction, it was 60 feet in one direction. And Every other one of these uh, uh, dots, like here and here, are the trunk of another tree. So again, very wide. And really, they form what many people call a root plate. And this wine glass sitting in the middle of this platter gives you a rough idea of what the canopy of the tree, the stem of the tree, and then the root system, the general relative proportions might be. Uh, and if anything, it's too, the platter is too narrow uh, for the size of what this tree would be. Uh, so the roots grow out wide and shallow and end up forming a kind of a plate that we actually sometimes see 
in nature when a tree blows over. Uh, this is some kind of conifer on the left, uh, and uh, it's blown over, and the trunk is much smaller than what you're seeing here. These are the roots that were flaring out from the base of the tree. And this spruce on the right is at a grade school <clears throat> that, again, it turned up that plate when it fell over. So I think it's a useful illustration to think of it as a root of the root system as a plate. OK. So uh, tap roots, uh, a lot of people focus on tap roots, talk about tap roots with trees. And there are tap roots that you can find on young trees like this one. Uh, this looks like maybe an ash. Uh, and that's definitely a tap root. But tap, this is within probably a year, year and a half of this tree growing from seed. And uh, once you get some age on a tree, these tap roots start breaking down. Basically, the, the root system goes somewhat deep quickly and then goes laterally, goes sideways from then on. And uh, tap roots in old trees would be really rare. And root systems are like this, wide and shallow, and uh, uh, and lots of interlacing roots, because that's what roots need and trees need to survive. But roots in particular need oxygen, water, and minerals. And all of those materials, certainly oxygen and water, in most cases are most available at the surface. Oxygen, definitely, water, usually, and minerals, usually, are all available in greater abundance near the surface. So you get what uh, the roots can, you get the root system that these conditions set up. So that's how roots grow in nature. How do we then take advantage of our knowledge of that to grow a, tree, a good tree root system, possibly not in nature, where we're trying to grow roots uh, for uh, uh, in a yard or uh, uh, a commercial area. Well, uh, again, we need to follow what we learn from nature. And uh, a few things I've thought of that uh, sometimes come up as inadequate are the plant material, the quality of the plant material. You need good plant material and good root systems to start with. Then you need to do quality planting and site prep. You need to occasionally do maintenance for the tree that affects the root system, and that has to be done well. And then you may need to do repair occasionally uh, of the root system, the root collar in particular. And we'll talk about each of these. So good plant material and roots. Uh, you need a tree and a root system that's alive. Uh, hopefully that's a little bit uh, a given. Um, that are, you need a root system that's wide enough. You're going to be transplanting a tree, unless you grow it from seed, that uh, most of the root system has been cut off. But you can. Uh, there's a way, a rule of thumb, for getting a wide enough root system from the nursery. You need a well-formed root system, and you want to avoid potted, or containerized trees for the most part, and uh, buried root collars. And then you need to take into account species and site compatibility. <coughs> so live roots. I put this picture in here just to remind me of this uh, development I was asked to come look at in the west part of the Salt Lake Valley, that uh, a number of these trees, you can see the ones behind that sign, were failing. And they looked odd to me because they had really slow growth, even though they had just put them in the ground. And typically, it's the next growing season where you'll get really slow growth. This was, I think, in August. And it turned out that they, when they got the trees in, they put them 
in on an asphalt parking lot and and then tried to keep them adequately watered and had them that way uh, for an entire year. So they maybe got there in, let's say, March or April. And they were there for an entire year, many of them were, and were finally planted in late summer of the following year. So the trees uh, had a lot of dead tissue just from being uh, uh, held, held that way, because it was very hot area and really hard to keep the trees adequately watered. And then they planted them with all their root system packing materials still on, including cords around the trunk. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. You need a wide enough root ball or, or potted tree if you're going with a containerized tree. And the rough rule of thumb that's used in the industry, uh, and this varies by, for conifers versus broadleaf trees, but uh, it's roughly, you want 10 to 12 inches of root ball diameter, so that would be that outer, the outer two arrows, for every inch of trunk diameter near the ground line. So that'd be the inner arrows, and that's called the branch collar, or the trunk collar. <coughs> so if this is a two inch diameter tree, you'd want a root ball that was 20 to 24 inches in diameter. And I do occasionally see root systems that are inadequate in width. And, uh, and you've left even more of the root system in the ground than you needed to if you do that. This is a, not a bad diagram of what a root system of a tree might look like. And if you dig a, a deep hole like this, which I could imagine some people thinking might makes sense because you want to, sometimes you hear about mirroring the top of the tree with the root system. And so going a little deeper might make sense to people who don't know what we all know, which is that root systems are shallow and wide. Uh, so, and instead, this would be a better root ball. Maybe not going quite as wide, but going, or as deep, but going wide. You need a well-formed, root system. And uh, we did a root washing and, and uh, planting uh, workshop uh, a couple of years ago. And we got in a container, bought a containerized tree. This was in a large uh, plastic pot and took it out of its pot and, um, and realized it had so many circling roots that the chances are we were going to end up with uh, this, what's pictured on the right. And this entire surface was just solid roots, mostly growing horizontally. Now, I think there are ways you can deal with that. And I don't know that I'm really going to go into that in this talk. But um, uh, I'd much rather see. Uh, planting bald and burlapped trees that lose a lot of their roots. I mean, the potted tree, you haven't really lost any roots initially. <clears throat> the problem is where the roots are is a problem. But uh, with the bald and burlap tree, you uh, are digging a tree in, in soil in a nursery, and the root system that it has inside this ball is going to be uh, fairly natural, uh, natural as much as roots growing in a nursery can be natural. And you'll get a more uh, natural spreading root system. You may end up actually having less root mass, uh, but the root mass is distributed better. And, uh, and you're much less likely to especially have problems later on where you end up with uh, uh, circling roots that then uh, can become girdling roots and kill the tree. So I much prefer bald and burlap trees or bare root trees uh, to container grown trees given how trees currently are being grown in containers. There are some uh, new systems out there that are better and uh, uh, for growing containerized trees. 
Uh, even so, though, one, an additional problem with containerized trees is the uh, uh, fact that often they don't use soil in the media that, that the tree is potted in. And I think this can be a problem later on when that stuff starts to decay and go away. and. Uh, and the tree has got to get its root system out into the surrounding soil to be uh, successful. <clears throat> and then species and site compatibility. Uh, you want tree species that are well adapted to the site and especially the soil conditions you've got. And we see three oaks here. I'm not sure. These might be English oak, Quercus rober, um, on the left. And they're doing much better than the Norway maple on the right. This is probably partly due to soil pH. Uh, our soil pHs here in Utah are generally quite high at low elevation sites. And uh, Norway maple, the tree on the right, usually doesn't show chlorosis till the pH is fairly high. Um, but uh, it's definitely showing some here. Plus, it's got some leaf scorch. The tree on to the right that you're just seeing off the screen there uh, is, I think, maybe a red maple, uh, Acer rubrum, and, and it's not doing well at all. Uh, so uh, try to select trees that are compatible for your site. OK, so besides good plant material, we need quality planting and site prep. And that involves having an adequate rooting volume that the roots can possibly grow in, a wide, shallow hole, proper depth, which means at or above grade, the grade it was planted at in the nursery, grown at in the nursery, remove packing materials, backfill carefully, use no amendments, and uh, have no surrounding root barriers. <coughs> now. This adequate rooting volume section is, is a little uh, tedious. It's just numbers and words uh, at first. But I want you to really, I don't know, if you're going to take any notes, take notes on this, although we will uh, post a recording of this webinar on our website uh, later today. Uh, but I dug around. I guess that's kind of a pun. Uh, I dug around uh, to find out uh, what research that's been done out there has said about how much rooting volume a tree needs or how much rooting volume you need to grow a certain size tree. And, uh, and what I came up with were these two ways of looking at it. Uh, and they're consistent not only with research studies I've found, but also consistent with uh, reality. And uh, so you want 60 to 120 cubic feet of soil per inch of trunk diameter, or one and a half to two cubic feet of soil per square foot of crown area. OK, so think about that. Um, well, for one thing, a cubic foot of soil, uh, it's got to be high enough in the soil, shallow enough that the tree's going to be able to use it. And, uh, and it's got to be in pretty good shape. I mean, this assumes a fairly well aerated uh, soil. Uh, you wouldn't, it wouldn't uh, count if you had a lot of rock in it. Uh, so you'd have to. Uh, add some some cubic footage if you had a lot of rock. Uh, if it was very compacted, again, you might need more cubic footage. Uh, but um, so to give you an example, then of a few of the studies I looked at, uh, Perry, uh, who used to be at North Carolina State University and has some great root research out there, uh, great publications, uh, scientific publications. Uh, came up with that a 20-inch diameter tree needs a 40-foot by 40-foot volume. He didn't really say how deep that would be, but depending on your assumptions, it comes to about 80 to 120 cubic feet of soil per inch of trunk diameter. And by the way, on larger trees, that trunk diameter would be measured 
uh, say at four and a half feet above the ground. So, so Perry's finding was in keeping with these figures. Uh, another figure from Nina Basic at Cornell University, uh, Nina developed structural soil that we'll talk about in a bit, uh, is two cubic feet of soil per square foot of crown area. So that is consistent, of course, with the one and a half to two cubic feet uh, per square foot of crown area. And James Urban came up with about one and a half cubic feet of soil per square foot of crown area, or 60 cubic feet per inch of trunk diameter. So he's a little on the low side. Uh, the low end, and that one and a half to two cubic feet of soil per square foot of crown area. So just imagine projecting the area of the canopy of the tree to the ground, and then you'll want enough soil volume so that you could go down a foot and a half to two feet uh, all around, and uh, that would be enough. Uh, one problem with that way of looking at it, the crown area way of looking at it, is it's uh, it, it's not going to work so good with like that first tree we looked at, that columnar uh, sugar maple, because it's a pretty big tree, and yet we're going to use the, a, a small crown area because it has a columnar crown. And then Urban also mentioned having parking strips at least four feet wide, and that's certainly something we often have to deal with. <clears throat> so another couple of uh, illustrations of how reality seems to fit with those figures. This is that apple tree we looked at earlier, and, and I just measured this based on the photograph and came up with that maybe it has about a six-inch trunk diameter. And if you uh, estimate the root system diameter and the depth of the root system, I come up with about 16 inches or 16 feet root system diameter and a two foot deep root system. And when you multiply that out, it comes to about 400 cubic feet for a six inch trunk diameter which when you divide comes to about 67 cubic feet per inch of trunk diameter. So with this tree, it works. Um, so uh, that's rooting volume uh, in terms of cubic footage you'd like. And, and, uh, uh, and then the, the rooting volume has to be, uh, as I mentioned, has to be accessible to the tree and and, and good volume so that the roots actually can grow out into that. I don't want just soil volume or uh, road base volume. I want uh, volume that roots can grow in. And so... Um, Mike, this is uh, Rose. Can I interrupt and ask a question? Sure, go ahead, Rose. Okay. This is a question that's relevant to rooting volume, so before you move on into something else, I thought I would ask this. Um, can trees in one planting area share this soil volume? Yes. Uh, I don't know that I've seen research results um, accounting for that, and I would tend to think that well, by sharing the soil volume, I assume he means uh, you could grow one tree in, say, 90 cubic feet of soil, or you could grow two feet in the, or two trees in the same 90 cubic feet of soil, or three or four or five. Um, I'm thinking that uh, probably you would need to add volume, maybe not equal amounts of volume as you add trees. It's going to depend partly on how complementary these trees are or shrubs that you grow in around the trees, how much turf you have, because turf can be quite competitive for the resources that the soil is giving the tree, especially water. Um, so uh, you're going to need more volume as you add more trees. But if you add a tree that's less demanding, 
then it's going to be on the low side. And if you had a tree that's more demanding, it's going to be on the high side. Uh, so maybe a gamble oak, you know, maybe isn't going to be real demanding, but uh, you put a Norway maple in that same volume, it's it's going to want all the volume that you're that you can give it. So um, uh, you need more more open ground rather than less. So uh, paving can be a problem. If you have paving, uh, using porous pavers can be good. Pavers that uh, either the paver itself is porous and can let let oxygen and water through or at least there are joints uh, that allow that material to move in. And, uh, and then you can use structural soil even over fully compacted road, or well, you can make fully compacted road base out of it. We'll talk about these. Um, the photo on the left are trees doing very well, being grown in uh, probably with structural soil, and there are these large pavers. Uh, they appear to be maybe a foot by two feet. Uh, this would be in kind of north Washington, D.C., and uh, these trees are doing well. Oh, and then the trees on the right are in uh, islands in St. George City in, in, in Utah, and I'd be happy to know if somebody knows how those trees have been doing. Um, you have to wonder with that island on the right uh, whether the soil volume that might be available way down at the end of that island um, there would be very available to these trees. It might be over time. It certainly wouldn't be at first. Um, so porous pavers, these actually aren't pavers that are uh, porous, but this is these are bricks laid in sand probably. And, uh, and these trees are doing very well. These are in Omaha, Nebraska, downtown. And the trees are growing, not being limited by the pavement they're in much. And uh, it's a good situation. If you want to pave, if you need to pave, uh, like uh, say using uh, concrete sidewalks, certainly streets, driveways, uh, an option is to use structural soil. And the classic structural soil is CU soil. Uh, they would just assume we only use the term structural soil in referring to uh, when we refer to CU soil. And that stands for uh, Cornell University soil developed by them, patented by them, and now uh, the patent I think is owned by or at least managed by, uh, I've got the name of the company at the end, and basically structural soils are a combination of sharp angled rock up to maybe a little over an inch across Sharp angles are important because when you compact this, you need soil volumes that uh, are created as the sharp pieces bridge over one another. Uh, if you had stuff that was too variable in size, and that's another thing, you don't want uh, a lot of variation in size with this. Um, uh, because if you had smaller and smaller and smaller material, it would fill in the uh, gaps that that you need to have for roots to grow in. And so what you've got is angular stone, fairly even in size. Let me get my arrow again. And uh, filled with soil in between. And this would be like a silt loam soil. Um, and they actually use a sticker of some kind. I think it's probably a polyacrylamide gel uh, that I'm guessing only is there for the initial mixing of the soil. You basically mix this at a, at a yard where maybe concrete uh, is made and where they're going to deliver this stuff to you. And they mix the soil, the rock, in 
exact proportions with the sticker in there and keep it a little bit moist and uh, and then they take the stuff to the site and put it down and you can compact it to full compaction uh, for concrete pavement but there are still gaps in there with soil in them that roots can grow through. This has to be limiting eventually to the success of of this tree um, and you couldn't possibly grow the same tree on this site uh, with structural soil that you could without structural soil with good access to uh, a well aerated uh, non non uh, compacted soil uh, but it may be better it may be the best you can do I just assume people do designs that don't rely on having trees in the mid middle of pavement. I probably need to hurry up a little more. Um, try to get this done in an hour with some questions. You want a wide, shallow hole. Uh, and uh, obviously, that's to reflect the fact that you're going to have a wide, shallow root system. And this is kind of ridiculous, but it's, it makes the point that wider is better and only as deep as the root ball is high. And uh, if you think about it, you could dig a small hole, put a tree in the middle of it, and then till all the way around the tree as far out as you want. That's essentially what you've done here. And that would be fine. Um, you want a prepared, well aerated area as wide as possible for those roots to grow horizontally into. You want proper depth. A lot of trees still coming out of nurseries are uh, being grown at or uh, prepared when, when they're moved. They end up with buried root collars. And uh, buried root collars kill a lot of trees, both early on when they're first planted, but also later when you end up with girdling roots. <coughs> Need to remove root ball packing materials. I don't see this as much as I used to, but I still see it quite a bit. And in fact, this is that development in the west side of the Salt Lake Valley, uh, what some of the trees looked like where they hadn't removed anything and hadn't even uh, dug a wide hole to have, to have backfill. They didn't backfill these at all. They just eyeballed the size and shape of the hole they needed and then dropped the tree in. Uh, no amendments at planting time. Uh, rarely would you need to fertilize at planting time. Trees are really good at surviving on low nutrient conditions. Uh, water is what I'm illustrating in the picture on the right. Uh, water is, is the main amendment you need because that's what the tree is going to need to survive. And uh, uh, And then organic matter and vitamins and things like that you really don't need. I'm OK with organic matter if it's really well composted and you have a very poor soil. But most people, uh, when they say they have a really poor soil, uh, it's really not as bad as they think for trees. Like clay isn't that bad for trees and, and it has some benefits. No surrounding root barriers. Root barriers. Uh, ignore the needs of the tree. The tree's got to have that soil volume to grow into. And uh, root barriers like this stuff shown up in the upper left, uh, uh, ignore that. That's the material that was used in the, the two pictures on the right. And good for the tree. The tree's actually figured out how to get roots over the root barrier. You can see that in the lower right. And uh, probably had deeper mulch at one time. The roots grow through the mulch and jumped over and the trees showing the people who did this what it actually needs, as is the London Plain on the left in a parking lot in California with a panel type root barrier system and it's just jumped right over it. And I say good for the tree. Uh, good maintenance, you need good maintenance to maintain a good tree root system. 
uh, and that includes irrigating appropriately, mulching, I like four inches in depth and maintain that depth, and no fertilizer without symptoms that tell you it needs fertilizer. So irrigating appropriately means moisten, moistening the soil as deep as the root ball is high or greater, uh, and use a probe if you need to. Uh, if you don't have too much rock in your soil, you can actually use a screw, long screwdriver, or you can rig something maybe with a T-handle. There are actually uh, probes made for finding uh, buried uh, drain tiles, things like that, that you can buy, and they have a rounded tip to them, and you just push them in, and when they hit dry soil or dry sand, they'll stop, and uh, that way you can uh, uh, calibrate your irrigation system so that you know how deep you're rooting. Um, you need to extend the irrigation as the tree grows. As it gets bigger, it's going to need more water. And uh, I actually had a person uh, call me about a tree that I looked at here. And they were being told by the person that they bought the tree from that uh, she was being told that giving the tree five gallons a day would be way too much water. This was a 15-foot high blue spruce grown on a southwest facing slope in a very hot location and uh, and he told her that the tree that five gallons a day was too much and I'll tell you that tree needs that's the beginning of the life of this tree it, already it needs more than five gallons and uh, large trees can actually use uh, 100, 150, 200 gallons a day. Uh, some trees actually can use that and need it. Others can use it but will survive on less. But you need to know the species and know what it needs. Don't saturate the soil for long periods because you'll kill roots. Uh, they need oxygen. Um, most trees we grow need 20 to 40 inches of water a year based on their natural needs. And uh, and most of that needs to come in the growing season. Uh, so, uh, but at low elevations, uh, snow typically doesn't amount to a lot of moisture for the tree anyway. Um, but uh, you need 20 to 40 inches a year, and uh, a tree that is more water loving might actually use even more than that than it would in, on its natural site because uh, our sites are hotter and drier and, than where many of these trees are grown. Like a uh, little leaf linden growing in Europe uh, wouldn't be exposed to the low humidities and high temperatures that it's exposed to in Salt Lake City. And, and let's say it gets 30 to 35 inches in England, uh, it might need another 30 to 50 percent more to do well here. Um, and so you need to know your species and how it's adapted to uh, dry sites and the ability to withstand dry conditions and then come out of it when things get better. Some trees can do that, some can't. Blue spruce is a great example of a tree that if you cut the water back on it, you're going to take uh, have a significant possibility that it'll get attacked by insects, and you may you could lose a large spruce tree quickly if you don't give it enough water. <clears throat> uh, mulching, I like mulch like that on the right, or uh, the mulch blowing being done on the lower right. Uh, mulch volcanoes aren't good. Uh, it's not a case of if a little is good, a lot is better. But mulch should be renewed uh, regularly. And uh, and if, you, if your mulch stays wet, I would remove it from around the base of the tree so the tree can dry out. Um, yeah, you really don't need to fertilize at planting time. I've said this before. Uh, and repair. Uh, so uh, sometimes you get compacted 
uh, situations where you need to do aeration and vertical mulching. Uh, you can also do root collar excavation. And then you may need to do construction mitigation to keep root systems healthy. Um, this is a workshop on the left that I was at in Minnesota and spoke at. And this guy was doing a demonstration of root collar excavations with a an air spade, which is just an air gun with a nozzle uh, attached to a compressor. And he could uh, bear off the root, uh, root crown, the uh, uh, I'm blanking out here, uh, the trunk base quickly. And uh, if you were having problems, say, with girdling roots or thought you were, uh, you can uh, do a root collar excavation. That's the term I was trying to think of. And uh, quickly determine what roots need to be cut. Um, you could also use this to do radial trenches out from the tree, like the diagram on the right. Uh, in a compacted area and then fill back in maybe with compost or something. And this person on the right is doing more laborious uh, core aeration. Aeration only is only will work if you remove material. Uh, systems that go in and inject air and fracture the soil don't really work because the, the soil will settle right back down. You need to remove soil and replace it with something to hold it open. Um, root collar excavation, I think, would be a great thing for people to sell as a service and to know how to do if, if you're institutional or with government. Uh, I'd like it if, if you do root collar excavation commercially, um, uh, indicate that in the chat pod. I'd just like to know if people are doing that. Um, and it's to fix buried root collars. Uh, girdling roots. Uh, you can use an air spade. Uh, I don't have one, so in my trees at my house, I've used hand tools and a vacuum shop vac. And it allows you to find and then prune girdling roots. Um, many trees need this. And you need to look for unexpected gradual decline, little or no root flare, trunk going straight into the ground. Uh, the trunk perimeter as it's reaching the root ball perimeter, if you have this decline, often that's when the girdling roots are starting to kill the tree. If the tree's planted too deep, it's more likely you have this problem. And then if you have a lot of fill over the root system, it's more likely you have this problem. And this is a tree that had girdling roots that I cut years ago. And this root just erupted after I cut some girdling roots. And it, I, I worried about it, but I thought it was OK. And actually, the tree came out of it for about 12 years. And I think this root was a large part of the root system that was absorbing water and minerals. Uh, but that when I exposed it here, I realized it was starting to girdle a root that is going like this. So there was a flare root here that's huge that was starting to be girdled by this tree. And I then have undertaken to remove that root. I cut it there. It's attached to the tree on its right side. And I actually was using the spade here to pry this up. And you can see the piece I broke off uh, there here. And this is the crater it was making. But still, there's bark there. So I think it'll heal. And that's where I cut it. I had to be very careful not to do great injury to the tree. And I'm hoping that next year, this area here starts to grow quickly, uh, its annual rings, and and we'll have uh, some new life on this tree because it has started to decline again. And I think it'll work. On the other hand, I've done this kind of thing with Norway maples and not been successful with one yet. Uh, but this was a little leaf linden. And I think it's been successful before, and it will be again. Uh, this is a Norway maple with girdling roots. Uh, and uh, this is that guy doing the root collar excavations. Uh, 
a lot of people wondered why this American elm wasn't doing well, and it turned out when this shrub bed was put in on the right, they actually cut off about a third of the uh, of the root system of this American elm to put in this edging, which just makes no sense at all. Uh, and this is just some girdling root removal. Uh, but that's a Norway maple, and that tree has not yet come out of it. Construction mitigation uh, would be you need to protect roots during construction and root collar areas. Uh, you need to do what you can to facilitate growth of the root system and of the tree while construction's going on and then regrowth afterwards. And uh, try things like careful excavation if you need to excavate near a tree, meandering pavement, rubber sidewalks, porous pavement, structural soil. Uh, so careful excavation, this is not that. And you, you really need to be on scene to be able to guarantee good excavation. This tree was actually, actually fell over in a storm uh, in the following year after these roots were cut. Um, <clears throat> meandering pavement, this didn't gain a lot with this tree, but Every foot you can move away from that tree before you have to be cutting large woody roots, you're better off. Rubber sidewalks give you flexible solutions. Rubber panels with uh, steel pins to kind of hold them together and uh, uh, to help with situations like this. And on the lower right, they've actually meandered the pavement as well. But these are rubber uh, panels. <coughs> This is a rubber sidewalk. Um, uh, I want to finish up quick, but if you can prune, root prune, if you have to root prune, the farther away, the better. And several studies have shown that if you can go three times the diameter of the trunk, diameter at breast height, or farther, you can increase the force it would take to pull over that tree or blow it over by seven times compared to if you do your root pruning at the root collar. And so try to avoid cutting buttress roots at the trunk at all. Cutting just one of those can reduce the pullover force needed by 12%. And cutting half of the buttress roots can reduce the force by 30%. So it's much more likely the tree will blow over or uh, fall if you cut close. And just going three times the diameter of the trunk out or farther can help a lot. So avoid this. Uh, I think I'll skip the examples. We actually saw several of these examples. And uh, Rose, we can do a few questions. Let's see. There's some questions here. Somebody says, they can, they find that Google Street View can be pretty handy for checking on trees. Yeah, it would depend on how recently they've uh, done your city, but yeah, if it's current, it can be. Um, somebody says the trees down the St. George Boulevard are doing great. Those were the trees we saw earlier. The soil was amended with 10% neutromulch to a depth of two feet. Neutromulch is a combination of uh, bark, I believe, and uh, uh, parts of turkeys, <laughs> maybe, and some manure. Uh, and the Chinese pistache trees pictured are now about 10 inches in diameter. And pistache is a really good species. Um, when is the best time of year to prune, root prune an established tree? It would be best early in the growing season when it's cool and moist, and especially if the trees don't have uh, leaves on them, uh, that would be best. Uh, late summer would be wor the worst. And is it a good idea to aerate street trees after a construction project? I guess, yeah, if you have an area you can actually aerate. Um, uh, lots of times with a street tree construction project, you're 
you've got pavement put back and you can't really do any aeration underneath it. But um, uh, it, certainly if you have an open soil volume that you can manipulate, then uh, doing aeration would be a good thing. Thanks.